I'm here at the newly opened Rimac campus in Croatia. This facility has cost around 200 million euros to create. And this is where the Nevera is going to be built and various other bits and pieces, including loads and loads of battery tech for various manufacturers. I'm here with Matej Rimac, who's the founder of Rimac Automobile and CEO of Bugatti Rimac. We've actually come here today to see a new concept, a new car that you have created, which is not a hypercar. It's not even a car you drive yourself, it's driverless. And we're going to find out a bit about it. I'm going to show you around its exterior. That is quite different to what I was expecting. I'll annoy the chief designer. Do you have the app? No. Did you install it on no. your cell phone? I'll ask some very awkward questions. Don't you think people just for fun are going to have sex in it a lot? Um. Right, so you're going to come to the UK what year? 27, maybe 28. But before we see the car, I need to ask Matty a very difficult question. Like, why do you think that you can create a viable robo-taxi and beat competitors such as Amazon, Tesla, Nvidia to make it viable and a proper usable car for the masses? Well, my previous job was high school. Uh, <laughs> I started with an E30 that was four years older than me, converting it into an electric car. And today, the Nevera is the fastest electric road car in the world. We are making technology and batteries for many car companies. They all come to us. I had absolutely no right to do any of that. In Croatia, where there was no car industry, I was a 20 year old guy when I started, had no idea about this whole thing. And if you look at really all the big stuff that happened, it wasn't the usual suspects. Elon announced the robo taxi in 2019. Tesla hasn't unveiled theirs yet. So it seems that you're ahead. Do you think you might be able to deliver it to market before then? So what was really important for us was we want to come very far before we show anything. So we had our first prototypes right here, like already from 2020. And then every year we continue to develop it and we wanted to keep everything under wraps exactly because of that because of high expectations and you know people announced and lots of stuff and nothing really happened so we came quite far so the car you will see there is pretty much how the car on the road will look like we want to launch it to have customer services in two years from now the question is what is a safer bet, Elon time or Mate time? <laughs> Based on past experience, I'm probably going to go with Mate time. We shall see. But what I find incredible is that you are best known for hypercars, obviously the Nevera yeah. and now Bugatti. Why this car? What's this all about? It's completely different. Basically, you know, I was being asked many times to hold speeches at events and in, in front of management and everyone was talking about electrification. For me, that was like, guys, why are we talking about this? This is old news. The real game changer is when ownership changes and when people don't drive anymore. That's going to completely turn the industry on its head, the biggest industry in the world. So we thought like, we have an idea how to do this in a different way where autonomous driving itself will be a given, like all cars will have the capability. It's not about that so much. That's just an enabler. So we wanted to focus on the user experience, which means it has to be super safe, super comfortable, convenient, clean, has to feel like your space, like you're in your living room. And that's what this whole concept is about. We thought we have a different angle. And like most people don't really care about car. It's a utilitarian thing. Otherwise Toyota wouldn't sell many cars. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> they do have GR. Yeah. And also for people like us, you don't enjoy driving everywhere and all the time. So you can still have your Miata for the weekend and drive up the hill. Driving through London or another congested city, you will see the experience in the Vern. It's like the best place where you can be. Like why would you choose to be miserable in a car and just, you know, not be able to do anything else with your time, but focus on the traffic jam in front of you. I think this is a really good opportunity now to actually go and see the car, which he has just mentioned is called the Verne. Let's have a look at it then, Mate. That is quite different to what I was expecting. Yeah, we didn't want to make it intimidating. The whole purpose is to make it the best user experience inside. From the outside, we just wanted to blend in the city. So what you can notice is there's a bunch of sensors without a big box on the roof. In a relatively small car, you should have a better experience than if you had your own personal driver in a Rolls Royce. So you are basically sitting where you would have the rear seats and everything in front is just a lot of space for you. So do you know what? I didn't think it would actually be as large as this, but I'm very, very interested by that concept about the inside because once again, that wasn't what I was expecting either. Anyway, let's find out some more about the car from the guy that designed it. I'm here with Adriano. He's the chief design officer. I'd like to have a look inside it because that I think is going to be the most interesting part. How do you get in? The experience itself starts with the app. So yep. do you have the app? No. Did you install it on your no. cell phone? Then you'll just have to press that button over okay. there. Opens like a charm. And it opens really wide, so should we climb aboard? 
Oh, now I came here to this campus today in a Mercedes E-Class. I've got to say there is definitely more room and more comfort already sitting in this than in the back of that E-Class. This is more room than a S-Class, than a Maybach, than a Rolls Royce. This is the best of the best. Our goal was we have like a room on wheels. This uh -huh. is your living room experience. Yeah. You want lots of leg room and you want a giant screen in front of you. Mm -hmm. You don't need to drive so you can enjoy just your ride. I think the only thing maybe is the screen potentially blocks maybe a forward visibility. Mm -hmm. One of the things I do when I'm in a taxi, I will take out the passenger <laughs> headrest. I really annoy the taxi drivers, just so I can see forward, because I like okay. to see my surroundings. You can consume whatever you want on there. You can watch a nice movie, you can listen to music, or you can just observe whatever happens during your ride. I like to go a little bit flatter. If you want to go flat, we need to start the ride. Safety first, we close the doors, we buckle in, and then we go. Okay, let's do that. The first thing you notice is in the center of the screen, there is the ride information. You can see whatever happens around the car in your environment. So a bit like on a Tesla where you can see it, like picking up other cars, cones, people, motorcyclists, all that kind of thing. A exactly. It's like, like that, but it looks higher def and a bit more detailed. Because it is. And then here, all your things from your cell phone, so you don't need to get it out all the time, just to see what the time is, and also where you're currently at and how much your estimated time to arrival is. And also here, you can just impress your favorite apps and you go and enjoy whatever experience you choose. I'm more of a PlayStation kind of person than Xbox. I'm sorry if you are. <laughs> uh, you, you, you will have to wait a little bit longer for us to enable that as well. I want to relax a little bit more. I've got all this space in my feet. I want to use it. You want to move your yeah, seat? Yeah, yeah, do it. Let's just... Ooh, Ooh, hello. So the seat will have five predefined positions. <gasps> of course, you can adjust it however you want. You will now go into the maximum position. So we this is the it, maximum recline position. We call it zero gravity. This is the maximum position you can also take when the car needs to brake quickly so that the seat belt is holding you. Right, because if I went flat like in business class on an airplane, which I might think I want to do, my seat belt won't operate. So in an accident, I'm going to get shooting would, forwards. You will just slip submarine. under me. So I was wondering what this ridge was for down here, but it's clearly where your feet go once you recline. This is, yes, of course. Course, where, where your feet go but this is for carry-on luggage this is a completely newly found space uh -huh. because there is no dashboard so all this space can be now used so can I open the door again or will you have to put the seat back up to the normal position we have to put the seat back up to okay. normal position we have to arrive of course as well open and the then door. we can open the doors and get out so I was wondering with this can you dim the glass if I want to have a sleep on my way to work you can do definitely do that so you see like we have this beautiful halo window above our heads but at the same time, when it's a sunny day, it will hit, will hit your head. Uh -huh. So yes, you press the button and it goes dark. But can we do it on this car? This is a first show car, this is plexi, this is not real glass, so the real thing will have it. I understand the luggage area there. What is this beam for? Is that structural? It almost reminds me of the altar when I used to go to church. I feel like yeah. I want to kneel there and get a blessing. This is, yes, structural, but also it helps you get out of the seat or move across. You know, the brave ones can put the legs up uh, there okay. and enjoy themselves. We worked quite a lot on this cup holder experience and this just slides in smoothly, you know, this yeah, memory it's, foam. Yeah, it's got memory foam. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, a yeah. new concept. That's and, a completely and new concept. It seems like a very good idea that it is more accommodating for lots of different sizes of cup. Yes. With certain ones, when they're rubber, you get that kind of exactly. like grips and then it lets it go and you spill coffee all yes. over you. What you can see in here is that there is no hidden compartments. When you get in the car and when you get out of the car that you don't forget stuff. That's a brilliant idea because there's no door bins because that's the kind of place where you'd leave stuff and this, this doesn't this lift fixed. up, so it's this fixed. So it's all fixed, you have your stuff on you because I'm someone who travels on planes a lot. Mm -hmm. And the amount of times I've left things in the pocket on a plane, yeah. including a hard drive with some very important secret footage, <laughs> don't know where that is. So you're always thinking about the fact that this car is gonna be used by multiple different users. You'll be able to configure all the Verne's interior lighting through the app before the car arrives. You can also set the temperature to be exactly what you want. And you can also choose from different smells that can be piped into the car's cabin. Shall we get and have a look at the outside again to see how this thing actually operates? Yes, and, please. But before we get into all the self-driving tech, I want to know about this car's performance. Because there's no point building an autonomous car if it can only manage a few miles on a full charge. Okay, so what battery is in it? Uh, it's a 60 kilowatt hour battery inside there, enough range for the whole day to be operated within a city. Obviously, it wouldn't go a long distance up the motorway. So this is currently just for the urban areas. This is not intercity. Later, we will maybe offer that as well. And what kind of performance does it have? It's, it's 
front wheel drive and it has approximately 200 horsepower. But it's not about the performance of this car, it's more about the reliability and the serviceability. And what is the weight of it? 2.1 tons. Obviously this is going to compete with like Uber. Have you got a special Uber driver setting where it's constantly on and off the throttle to make you feel a bit sick? No, uh, we, we skipped that one. Oh, okay, so I'm just being stupid. Let's actually talk about something serious, such as how it works. So obviously this is one of the sensors here. It's a short range LiDAR and we have six of those around the, the corner. On each side, two on the front. Two on the front. Oh, and before course, we go there, I noticed yeah. we've got cameras there. With nozzles. So there is a special cleaning solution here that we have. We spritz water and we have air. That's also used again for figuring out the obstacles around the car. Is that correct? Yes, of course. You That's said. why it needs to stay clean as well. So in terms of the actual design, what kind of look were you trying to create? It looks like a car. It looks like a hatchback. But yeah. obviously, like this part of it looks different. And like with a two-tone. It needs to blend into the city. It also needs to stand out in a certain way and be timeless. You will not buy this car this car will be in your city for a very long time. We imagine this always to be like a spaceship landed on a 70s sports car. Uh -huh. Don't you think people just for fun are going to have sex in it a lot? Night out, bundle into here, no driver to keep the eye on them. I think I should try it as well then. It sounds like a jokey question, but yeah. it is something that you're going to have to think about. The humans are humans. Yes. They may do things that you might not want them to in a vehicle like this when it hasn't actually got someone mm -hmm. looking over them. There is cameras in the car yeah. that take a picture before the ride and after the ride. Uh -huh. So if you make a mess, yeah. we will know. And you can only enter the car with your profile. And you can only download the app and make a profile if you put your details in there and your credit card. Yeah, okay. People are so having sex in it. Okay, so even if you could enjoy a bit of dogging, most people won't. Well, hopefully not anyway. But will other people be able to take actual pet dogs for a ride in this new car? So let's have a look at the amount of space you've got in there. It's quite a decent sized boot, that is. So this is over 600 litres of boot space and you can put in there at least two big cases. And pets, some people might want to take the dog with them. Do you yes. put the dog in here or what? Depends on the size. Smaller dogs you can put in the front, bigger items you can put in here. What about then, I've got a three-year-old, I need to get a baby seat in it. The seats are ready made for Isofix. You go in the app, you click that you, you, that you want to pre-install baby seat and it comes with a baby seat. Why don't you create an extra seat or two so that your family can use it? It's for two people because nine out of 10 rides is maximum two people. And if you're a bigger family or more people, you just order two. This is exactly what people do with Ubers and minicabs. You don't walk home from the pub with your mates just because you don't all fit in one car. You just order another one. And this new car should be a lot more comfortable than your average taxi too. I'll let Adriano explain why. We have triple isolation. So first is the rubber, and then of course is the suspension, which is not air suspension, it's just a regular suspension because this car would drive a lot of miles and complex systems break easily. And then <laughs> we have a leather frame, the cabin on top. So it has bushings that take out the, the last vibrations out of the system. I mean, what kind of miles do you think these things are going to be doing over a year? 100,000 kilometers per year, yeah. Really? And yeah, obviously yeah. that's in town as well. So it's short journeys over rutted roads. It needs to be super reliable because you take them off the road, then they're losing money. Yes. But making sure this car is reliable should be a walk in the park compared with getting all the autonomous driving technology to work correctly. Even Tesla is struggling to get it right, and that's one of the biggest car makers on the planet. So how is Vern gonna do things differently? Well, here's their CEO, Marco, to explain how. I've seen the car, I've seen how it can be used from a user experience. But one thing that's missing is like the whole autonomous driving thing. That is complex. To make a car drive itself through a congested city without crashing into people, how are you achieving that? So we partnered up with a company we think is the best in the field, Mobileye. And they have a very interesting system which is fully redundant. So they have a set of cameras that can drive on their own. And they have a set of LiDARs and radars that can also drive on their own. They do it basically on top of each other. So it's much safer. It means that you have to do much less testing because they can actually see the speed for instance at which the average driver is driving versus the legal speed so you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna drive the legal limit but you can also drive the speed that the average driver is driving tesla doesn't use lidar in its cars it relies on cameras for its full self-driving technology instead to be fair the jury is still out on whether this is the best solution but there's another big reason why the owners of Vern decided to use this mobile eye technology it's already being used in tens of millions of cars from BMWs to Nissans. Well, a less advanced version of it is at least. And the data from these systems has helped them build extremely detailed maps of streets all over the world. So lots of the hard work has already been done. 
On top of that, we're also building the car to be safe because you will be operating in a mixed environment. So there will be humans around you that will make mistakes. So even if the car is driving perfectly, somebody will crash into you. And what we see is that most severe impact is actually from the rear. This is the one that you cannot avoid. So we're actually developing the car to be super safe also from that perspective, using all of the data that we currently have to make like a cocoon around you. So how many cars does Verd need to build if it wants to compete with services like Uber? It might not be as many as you think. Vern isn't trying to completely replace public transport. Instead, it'll work alongside buses, trains, and trams in future cities. And by predicting patterns in customer behavior, the cars will spend less time waiting and more time driving, which means you need fewer cars. They can also predict where they'll be needed, so they can be ready to pick you up outside a nightclub at closing time. And they can spread themselves evenly around a city, so there'll always be a car close by. Just like with Uber, you'll order a car using an app on your phone. You put in the address you want to drive to, and it will show you the quickest route and the closest Vern to your location. You can change your collection point and leave feedback after your ride. Once Vern is up and running in Zagreb, Marco reckons you'll only need to wait between five to seven minutes for a lift, which is about the same time as you have to wait for an Uber. Let's take Zagreb as an example because we have loads of data on simulations. You can have 500 cars in Zagreb, which is a one million city, yep. and you can take 30% of all of the taxi market with 500 cars only because you can do it much more efficiently. So these cars are running basically 23.5 hours in a day, so there is half an hour that it's being cleaned and charged and maintained, but the rest of the time it's running. We're actually trying to make the cost per kilometer as low as possible so we can have a super competitive service with the best user experience. So essentially, you say you're gonna get close to the normal taxi on price, that's the objective. We should actually go lower than the normal taxi. With yeah. better luxury and- Absolutely, that's and the not goal. having a that's the goal. Uh, a taxi driver listen to your conversations. I think privacy is going to be one of the key features of a robot taxi. Part of the job of the driver is making sure that you're safely buckled in, that you don't leave your stuff, that you keep the car clean and so on. And this is what we're replacing with automation. We actually have a smell detection in the car. So <laughs> if the car is not smelling well, it's not going to come and pick you up. It's going for cleaning. So it won't even give me a ride then. <laughs> no, no. If, if somebody ate like what we say here in Croatia, chivapi with onions, yeah. like which is a, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's not a good smell. <laughs> yeah. The car is going for, for cleaning after that. And how does that work? So this is so, an illustration. This is the third part of the whole ecosystem. You think of it as a mini factory so the car comes in here at least once a day uh -huh. it gets inspected it goes for maintenance if, if it's necessary it goes for cleaning and it goes for charging all of that within half an hour so the rest of the time the car can be picking up people and driving them around it can be used it can make money these Vern motherships are modular and they can be constructed in different ways depending on where Vern wants to build them this one has an open plan design to suit a city like Zagreb and this one has more shaded areas to cope with extreme heat so it's perfect for cities in the Middle East and they've also developed a high-rise version for crowded cities like Tokyo each mothership can maintain charge and clean about 500 Vern cars when are people in Croatia going to be in Zagreb going to be able to so we're aiming to launch the the first service by 2026 and then next year after that two years in Less two than years. two years. Yeah, in two years. We want to go to UK next. So we would aim to go into UK 27, maybe 28. Depends on the other cities that we roll out. So and what kind of city would you be looking at? London? Isn't that a bit mental trying to do it in London? We'd probably do a smaller city first, something like uh, Coventry or Birmingham or Manchester. Uh, these are the cities that we're currently talking to. We have 11 cities that have signed on from the UK, from Germany, and also from the Middle East. So these cities actually said, like, we want your service here. We want to work with you. And we're working with them as partners. Well, it's a very ambitious project. And I'm going to put the question to you that I put to Matty. How do you think you're going to be able to compete against the likes of Tesla yeah. with their robo taxi, which we think is going to be based on their smaller car, yeah. their Model 2? One thing is like really the focus on customer experience across all of the touch points. This is something that we're really nailing down. And the second thing is like, when you think about cost, the car cost is actually less than one third of the overall cost per kilometer. These things like cleaning, charging, maintenance, insurance, this is what takes the majority of the cost. So if you can do that efficiently, you can still have a competitive service, even if we don't have the volumes that Tesla will have at the start. Obviously you work with OEMs, it's gonna affect their businesses. Yeah, some of the OEMs actually want to join in. So we have Kia as a shareholder, for instance, and some will have probably some options on this in the future. It's to be seen, yeah. Well, it is to be seen. It's gonna be interesting to see exactly how this plays out, whether you can get this viable Vern car out there being used commercially by people before the likes of Tesla, NVIDIA, other companies like that. Very, very interesting. I mean, the chances are low, but the chances of everything that we've done were low or zero. <laughs> yeah. So like we're, we're used to it, yeah. Who knows? Yeah.